I'll start with a very simple point. And my point is that the European Union, as we knew it, even two years ago, does not exist anymore. And it does not exist first, because all the major integrating forces that people have been talking about, all these famous pillars of the European Union that people have been discussing, they are not here anymore. The first one, which everybody starts talking about, is the memories of the World War II. And everybody is talking about the peace project. But let me give you one example. Three months ago, there was a study, four months ago, that had been done in the German schools, asking people basically to give their views on how human rights have been uh, protected in four different regimes, starting with Nazi Germany, after that going with uh, Eastern Germany, Federal Republic, and Germany now. One third of the German uh, school boys and girls believe uh, that uh, the human rights have been as protected during the Nazi Germany as they, they are protected now. Uh, and basically on many of these issues, you're going to see that uh, the Nazi period simply has disappeared. It's not that you have, this is not about nostalgia, this is not that people want to go back. For this younger generation, it simply doesn't matter much. And it doesn't matter, uh, and this is basically we can see also in other countries, with the internet and the possibility for the younger people much more to communicate within their own generations. Because one of the things that is happening is that the internet makes it much easier to you to talk to people on your age from all other places. There is a less eagerness to talk with the people from a different generations. So, in a certain way, Fukuyama was right about the end of history, but in a wrong sense. The history ended because nobody is interested in it anymore. But what I basically want to make, the first point is that you do not have the memory of the World War II existing as a shaping factor in European politics these days. You can hear this in speeches. You're not going to see in the way people are trying to understand, probably with the exception of the, of the older generations. Plus, you have all these new immigrants and others coming outside of Europe, whom all this talk about World War II does not make any sense. If you have an African immigrant going to France, all this story about the French-German relations doesn't make any sense. So this is the first, but don't forget how much we have been basically trying to link the problem of Europe with the problem of, uh, of the World War II. The second is the geopolitical rationale of the European Union. Soviet Union is not around anymore, and Europeans feel so secure. Uh, we have been making the studies, basically, especially even on the level of the European elites, uh, that even for the European elites these days, they cannot imagine a real security threat. When you're pushing them to talk about the security threat, they go about climate change and about economic developments and others. Not a classical hard security problem being perceived. And for sure, Russia cannot play the role the Soviet Union is being in order to unify uh, uh, European publics. The third important thing that people are always talking about European Union is prosperity. Uh, but let's give you the results of uh, the survey that has been done in all European countries in April of this year. More than 60% of Europeans are sure that their kids are going to have a life which is worse than their own. And this goes in different countries. In Greek Germany, or now in suffer increase, if there is something which is common, this is the understanding that the next generation is going to be a worse off. It's not going to be a better off. And also, if you go with the problem of the democratic welfare state, that was so important for the European project. Here we also have a problem. I'm strongly uh, recommending to you the work by a German sociologist and political scientist, Wolfgang Streck, uh, if I'm pronouncing his name rightly. Uh, but he did, in my view, uh, a very interesting analysis on the political economy of the welfare state. And the major argument is that the welfare state is not simply that it cannot be sustained because of the costs, the normal liberal argument that you're taking. The problem is that even now, when you have this major crisis in the market, the trust in the government is not coming back. And by the way, from this point of view, this crisis is very different than all previous crises. In the 1930s, people started to mistrust the, the market as a result of the Great Depression, but they started trusting the government. And this was true for the United States, it was true for Soviet Russia, it was true for Nazi Germany. 
In the 1970s, you can get the other way around. There was a major disappointment with the economic performance of the governments. People believed that the government cannot do it anymore. But there was a regained trust in the market. Now you have mistrust both to the government and to the market. And it goes on different levels. And Streck's major argument is that in a strange way, you cannot expect anymore that the failure of the market is going to push for the regain of the trust to the government. Because what has happened is that, in his language, the demands for the government of goods has disappeared. The government was great when he was facing the needs of people. The government was great when it was treating people as equal. But now, because of the way the market basically has socialized us, we don't want to be treated as equal. We want to be treated personally. We basically all the time want it to be taken personally in the way basically the market is treating you. And from this point of view, this is very important because if the welfare state is in crisis, for the European Union, this is the other name of the European model. But there are four other, in my view, important factors behind my uh, claim that European Union, as we know it, does not exist anymore. The first is the balance of power. The European Union was about German Franco leadership, and now the relations between France and Germany are very different. To talk about a particular partnership between Germany and France is not the case. And even more, the monarch crisis is going to develop, the difference of power between Germany and France is going to increase. So the power structure from this point of view uh, of the European uh, dynamic has been very much changed. Plus, if the uh, European Union was very much created with the idea to handle the tensions between East and West of Europe, now you can see that the tensions between North and East, uh, South are becoming much more important uh, uh, than basically the classical uh, East and West within the European Union. The second is the convergence. For the last 30 years, the poor parts of the European Union have been becoming or coming closer in terms of wealth to the richer parts of the European Union. With this crisis, this is over. If we're going to have the projections which everybody is working with on the performance of Greece and Germany, you're going to see that in 20 years, Greece is going to be poorer with respect to Germany than it was when it entered the European Union. So if before the European Union was a convergence machine, basically taking and redistributing, you're going to see that now you're going much more to see the convergence of policies, but uh, uh, divergence uh, of performances. And plus, which in my view is also quite important, you have the problem with the crisis of solidarity. Uh, even theoretically, it's very difficult to keep the solidarity on the European level. Tell me how to do it. Why, for example, imagine that you are, and this is true for the Poles, for Germans, for anybody. But why you should give money to the Greeks? On one level, if you are very much kind of an altruistic person, is it not better to give money to the kids in Africa who are really dying out of hunger? So is this solidarity on a global level not much more natural? You're giving to those who need most. On the other side, if you're much more kind of a community person and basically thinking in terms of solidarity of family and locality, is it not much easier to give to somebody who is poor and who you know personally? I'm asking this because there was a very, in my view, extremely interesting study being done asking the question, what determines the support or the lack of support of the German voters with the respect of the Greek bailout? And normally the politicians are going to tell you that what basically determines the support is the economic interests of the people. This study did not uh, basically show this. It appeared that the level of altruism and cosmopolitanism is a much more strong predictor if somebody is going to support the Greek bailout or not. Not basically the economic interest coming out of it. And by the way, much stronger than party affiliation. It was done in also in a very nice way because it was a combination of a classical survey technique with some of these tricks of the behaviorist economics which are becoming so popular these days, which means that when you've been basically surveyed, they're telling you also that you can just win a voucher of 100 euro, and you should decide to which type of a charity you're going to donate it. And you have the African Kids Charity, you have the local charity, you basically you have all this, so they're trying to see in a certain way what is the map. 
uh, idea of solidarity, and it appeared that people who are much more altruistically uh, positioning themselves, which are really going to give to others, are much more ready to support the Greek bell, even if their economic interest goes against it. And uh, the last thing, to my also important uh, uh, argument why the European Union, as we know it, does not exist anymore, is simply the fact that uh, seen from outside the European Union, it has been changed very much. Recently, we had basically this uh, 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 conference in which we invited Chinese, Russians, Turks, and Americans to talk about the European crisis. It was amazing. To the Chinese, strangely enough, <laughs> the result of the crisis is that according to them now, there are two Europes. There is one Europe which works, and it's called Germany. And this is another Europe which does not work, and they're not much interested in it anyway. But for Chinese, everything is about China. It's very much in what looking today. Americans much more than before in a certain way interested uh, for Europe to make it. But on the other side, they cannot understand why Europe is doing nothing to become the United States of Europe. Because for them, basically, they perceive their own constitutional arrangement as the natural one, and they cannot understand why we're not moving in this direction. Uh, Russians being very ambiguous. On one level, they never believed in the post-national formations because they basically believed that the Soviet Union was such a formation that it collapsed. On the other side, they are very much fearing that the crisis of the European Union is going very much also to touch on them. Strangely enough, for the first time this year, public opinions both in Russia and Turkey claim that Asia is more important for their countries than the European Union. Uh, there was a study that we've been dying for the last decade with transatlantic trends. Uh, and of course, Turkey is the only one who has been very much interested for different reasons in the crisis. But what I'm saying is this. I'm saying this because not that the European Union was perceived as bad or collapsing. I don't believe that you have this in any of these war debates. But European Union starts to be perceived more and more as irrelevant to their own problems because all things that before we believed are universal in our experience start to be viewed by others as exceptional. The postmodern nature of our politics the way we're basically organizing all this. For the Chinese, for the Russians, for the Turks, and even for the Americans, it looks, it's fine, but it's not about us. And secondly, this crisis shows one very important kind of a understanding of the weakness of Europe as a global power. Uh, German sociologist Nicholas Luhmann uh, had a very, in my view, interesting and important uh, definition of power where he basically believed that the power, this is the capacity to overthrow your problems on others. And from this point, if you look at two players that have a huge debt problem, on one side is the United States of America, huge debt problem. By the way, also quite dysfunctional political system recently. Nevertheless, the Americans basically are refinancing their debt on a very favorable terms. On the other side, at least until recently, you can see that Spain and Italy and Greece being totally punished, punished for their debt, exactly because the European Union did not succeed to make our problem other people's problem. The major message to Europe was, you have a problem, solve it. The major problem with the Americans was, they have a problem, we have a problem. Uh, and I do believe this is also something that basically pushes me uh, to make this statement that the European Union as we know it does not exist anymore.